And now we leave prehistory behind and move into history. The Neolithic Age saw hugely important advances, including the advent of agriculture, the domestication of animals, and the invention of pottery. And then around 3200 BCE, civilization took another leap forward, and it took this leap in four river valleys. We'll leave the Indus and Yellow River civilizations for a later unit. In this unit, we are going to hang out in Mesopotamia, or the land between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and in the Nile Valley. Although we'll lump these two civilizations or civilization centers together in a unit, their differences are really more fascinating than their similarities. And art provides, as it happens, an intriguing clue as to these differences and great opportunity for some comparative analysis. But first, let's watch a video clip about what may have been the world's first true city, Uruk, in ancient Sumer, now part of modern-day Iraq. So what made cities possible, and why did cities make such a difference to history, and especially to the history of art? I'm going to take those questions in order. As the video indicated, agriculture made cities possible. There had to be enough surplus food to feed people who were not engaged in hunting, gathering, or other forms of food production, and only settled agriculture provided this much food. Rivers watered fields and made large-scale agriculture possible in turn, but taming these rivers also tended to require significant civil engineering. Organizing large-scale communal endeavors like major irrigation projects in turn demanded a level of administrative complexity beyond that required by early Neolithic settlements. This means that new structures of governmental power and authority evolved. Leaders in these communities used art to portray and to strengthen their rule, and supporting these new centralized authorities was organized religion, which turned out to be another powerful impetus toward art. There's a real danger that our history will become nothing more than a dizzying succession of images that you try to cram into an overworked brain. What I want to do today is to begin helping you to organize these works in your own minds by introducing some of the general themes that will appear throughout the course. In this unit, we will in particular explore three themes, power and authority, sacred spaces, and artistic conventions that reinforce both political authority and religious belief. When we turn to Egypt in a couple of days, we will find a civilization dominated by the Nile's extremely dependable cycle of a river that first floods and then recedes from the valley, leaving a straight strip of fertile soil in its wake. Not surprisingly, this civilization developed a religion that worshipped a regular cycle of nature, even as it celebrated the unchanging linear nature of Egyptian life. The Tigris and Euphrates were nowhere nearly as cooperative as the Nile. The spring floods they produced were unpredictable, and often they wiped out everything in their path. The cooperative engineering feats that tamed the river helped build an urban civilization, but the river was never entirely tamed. The Fertile River Valley, Fertile river Valley also attracted constant invasion from nomadic tribes in the hills. There was no Sahara Desert to create a barrier against invaders. Why grow crops when you could just steal them? Maybe because of the continued uncertainty of their lives, the Sumerians did not have a reassuring religion. They believed that the dead person survived in the form of a ghost who lived in the underworld. An obligation of surviving relatives was to make funerary offerings of food, drink, and oil. Without these offerings, or worse, without proper burial, the ghost would be forced to wander around and might haunt the living. Yet conditions in the underworld were also pretty dismal. The dead were in utter darkness, feeding on dust and scraps. So let's watch another video clip, this time about the Sumerian religion. Note that you should gain insight into the function of two of our required works, the statues of votive figures from the square temple at Ashuna, shown here, and the white temple and ziggurat of Uruk. For all its extraordinary accomplishments, the invention of the wheel, the invention of writing, the creation of the first large-scale engineering projects and urban administrative complexes, Sumeria was not a civilization filled with hope and confidence. The Sumerian religion and Sumerian art instead reflected a civilization, as I said earlier, constantly flooded, but buffeted by rivers that constantly flooded and changed boundaries, city-states that were constantly at war, 
and repeated invasions from less civilized but more warlike neighbors. This photo shows us what archaeologists found in Sumerian ziggurat temples, not images of kings or even gods, but images of worshippers imploring gods not to harm them. At no other time in the history of the ancient Near East has non-royal sculpture survived in such abundance. So why use dolls to approach the gods? These are surrogates for the people who could not themselves enter into the presence of Sumeria's scary gods. These surrogates could also stay in the temple begging for favor, even as the individuals whom they represented went about their daily work. We've talked about the content and function of this work and established a context. Now let's turn to form. What do you notice about the form of these figures? Time to practice some visual analysis. What strikes me most, and probably you as well, are those wide open eyes, fearful, alert, unsleeping. There's no sign of an eyelid here. The figures radiate anxiety in the face of God's fate and, and an unpleasant afterlife. These figures cannot sleep since only eternal vigilance will placate their gods. In other words, this is symbolic or conceptual rather than optical art. The figures do not show much facial variation and they tend to assume the same stance, left foot forward, hands clasped right over left. The shapes are very simple and geometric, basically cones and cylinders. The heads are disproportionately large, reflecting the belief that this is where the soul resides. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell their size from the college board image, which is why I included the photo of a grouping of these statues. Here we see that the votive figures vary considerably in size, from one to three feet, with the size probably reflecting the status and wealth of the petitioner. We will see the term hierarchy of scale or hieratic scale all the time, so start learning it now. Art very often portrays importance with scale. Important figures are bigger than less important figures. You should recognize this panel from the Pallet of Narmer, which you learned about over the summer. The pharaoh, you'll see, is much larger than his official. The official is much larger than the laborer carrying the pharaonic symbols. And hierarchy of scale is not limited to Near Eastern art. Here is a Mayan example. Note the relative size of the king. And here is a Christian example from the Middle Ages. Christ in the center is much larger than the surrounding figures. So, where were these statues found? They were mostly found in the ruins of temples. The temple stood at the center of a Sumerian city, perched atop a stepped ziggurat. The surrounding countryside was flat, so the ziggurat served as a kind of man-made mountain leading to the heavens. Sumerian cosmology described the world as a disk of land, which was surrounded by a saltwater ocean and then a freshwater lake. A world mountain was forming an axis mundi, that is a kind of central axis, that joined these three layers and constituted the center of the world. So the temple was a meeting place between gods and men. The plan of the temple was rectangular, with the corners pointing in cardinal directions to symbolize the four rivers which flow from that central axis mundi, or central mountain, to the four world regions. This orientation also let the temple roof serve as an observatory for charting the heavens, and this information in turn was used to maintain a calendar. A ziggurat was usually square or rectangular. It had a core of mud brick and an exterior of baked mud brick. It had no internal chambers, an, ex an exterior tri triple stairway or spiral ramp led to the top of the ziggurat where a temple was located. So why build a temple from mud brick instead of stone? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward. Mesopotamia did not have much stone. Placing the temple on a man-made mountain made practical sense as well. Remember that those ra remember those raging rivers? The ziggurat was a high place on which the priests could escape the rising water that annually inundated the lowlands and occasionally would flood for hundreds of miles. The ziggurats were also easy to secure. Since the shrine was accessible only by way of three stairways, a small number of guards could prevent non-priests from spying on the rituals in the shrine at the top of the ziggurat, rituals such as cooking sacrificial food and burning the carcasses of sacrificial animals. Remember, these were hungry gods. Each ziggurat was part of a temple complex that included a courtyard, storage rooms, and living quarters built around which, around which a city was built. 
So what political point does the reconstructed ziggurat make? Well, this religious and administrative mountain signaled that the gods ruled the city and that the rulers had the ear of the gods. The separation of church and state is non-existent in this and most of the societies we will study until we get to much more recent times. This is probably the most famous ziggurat. Its remains were excavated in the 1920s and 1930s by Sir Leonard Woolley. Saddam Hussein partly reconstructed the ziggurat in the 1980s as a monument to the glory of his regime. Note that this temple staircase follows a bent axis plan. The doors of the long axis were the entry point for the gods and the doors of the short axis the entry point for men. So anyone entering would have to make several turns. Maybe this reflects the uncertainty of the Mesopotamian religion. The gods needed to be approached fearfully and indirectly. Here's a photograph of the original excavation of the ziggurat of Ur. So I've been talking specifically about the ziggurat and its relationship to Sumerian culture. Let's zoom out for a moment and think about the second theme for this unit, and a hugely important theme for the course, the way sacred spaces both reflect and reinforce the religious beliefs of a culture. We will be looking at a lot of religious buildings in this course, and for that matter, we'll be looking at a lot of religions. But whatever the religion, sacred spaces tend to have certain elements in common. Many, though not all, allow for only exclusive access, often by priests, maybe the king. For example, many mosques had special areas set apart for leaders, and in Catholic churches, only the priests could approach the altar and the apse. While some traditions, such as some forms of Protestantism, reject the decoration of churches, most religions embellish and fill their sacred spaces with art and precious materials. Sacred spaces are almost always the location of specific rituals and ceremonies. And finally, sacred spaces are often located in places with a special history or significance. For example, the location of a miracle. Note the small cella or house of the gods. The votive statues were found in waiting rooms outside the cella. Only the priest could enter the cella. Again, we see exclusivity. It's harder to see the material wealth and decorative features from ruins or reconstruction, but we know from archaeological finds that the original ziggurats and temples were covered with colored glazed brick and decorative tiles. We saw some of the ceremonies on the videos. By the way, the temples were used not only as special feeding places for the gods, but also for food storage and public administration. This again reinforced the link between political and religious authority. And finally, the ziggurat and temple stood at the center of the city, yet they still reached toward the heavens. Again, this location reinforced the link between spiritual and political authority. After that brief digression into sacred spaces, a theme to which we will often return, I want to look at more elements of power and political authority in the ancient Near East. Mesopotamia was rich in soil and water, but not in metals, stone, or other valuable goods. To acquire these goods, Mesopotamian city-states needed to engage in trade, and this seems to be the context in which writing first developed. On the left, you see an early uh, cuneiform text made by pressing a stylus into clay tablets, which then dried. Most of the cuneiform texts we have are legal or financial documents secured with seals that identified who was conducting the transaction. The cylinder seals on the right are not required works, but they offer an excellent example of the difference between sunken relief, or intaglio, and bas relief, or a slightly raised surface. Cylinder seals were carved in sunken relief and then rolled over wet clay where they produced a bas relief. The third required work in this unit offers strong evidence for the Sumerian dependence on trade. Note that the precious materials used to make this object come from far beyond Sumer. I know it must seem as if we assign every Khan Academy video, but actually, we've saved this one for showing in class, partly because it includes such a good review of Mesopotamian culture. So let's watch up to the listed time, and then you can discuss what you saw. So now that you've watched the video, what have you learned about the function of this work? Actually, we don't know precisely, except that it probably isn't a military standard, therefore it's misnamed. We do know that this was found in an elaborate burial site, so it was an object of great significance and probably had some kind of ritual meaning. 
Another reality of Sumerian life was, as I've already mentioned, constant warfare, war between Sumerian city-states and war against invaders from the hills. By the way, this work offers evidence of a technological innovation that transformed warfare. Any guess what I'm talking about? Chariots, which enabled fighters to move faster and fire from a platform. Let's finish the Khan Academy video. The third theme I want to discuss today is the way cultures adopt certain stylistic conventions to convey a message about power and authority, about religious belief, or sometimes just to tell a story. The hierarchy of scale is obvious. The king is larger than the guests at the banquet, and the guests are larger than the servants. We talked about narrative when we looked at the works depicting Judith and Holofernes. Storytelling that glorified the rulers and honored the gods was central to this culture, and the standard of Ur especially clearly displays some of the stylistic techniques that are used to make the narrative clear to the viewer. So the artist employs continuous narration, choosing not to portray either the battle or the possibly post-battle celebratory banquet with just one image. Instead, we see a series of images, possibly through, though not definitely, in chronological order. And to separate the events and the social classes, the artist employs registers or bands of narratives. We still use registers to tell some stories, right? As the Khan Academy video noted, we also see a stylistic convention for portraying people. The faces are in profile, yet have a frontal eye. The shoulders are squared, facing forward, but the legs are shown in profile, with the feet moving lockstep in a single direction. Notice that the animals are similarly shown in composite perspective. We see both horns on the animal on the right and all four legs. So why did the artist choose this perspective? Well, it was probably required by the artistic canons of the civilization. Originality was not actually yet considered much of an artistic advantage. But as we noted in the discussion of prehistoric art, this perspective also conveys a great deal of information, if at the expense of some realism. And that's more than enough for now. Tomorrow we will finish up the civilizations of Mesopotamia and then move on to Egypt.